Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you. I have a special testimony to share with us. You may be wondering why I'm holding flowers, but I'll explain that. So we've mentioned a coffee run before. And what the coffee run is, it's not, you know, where we're practicing for the marathon with Abby and we're drinking coffee to fuel us. Or if we go to our cafe and we get to sample all the best coffees and we go to jobs and we sample theirs. That's not what it is. But actually, it's one of the ways we do outreach here in Cairn. And we go out, like on Saturday evenings usually. And last night we went out, and it was our fourth time. And there were six of us that went out. And we got to meet about 25 people roughly, to pray with them, to share the gospel with them. There's two people who prayed to accept Christ. And there's one lady, Catherine. You can clap for that, yeah? It's really a great opportunity to hear what people are, to hear what they're going through, and to just share with them, you know, what we do as a church to invite them to come in. And one of the people we met, she sells flowers in Cairn, her name is Catherine, and she gave us these as a gift to the church. And so I told her, I was like, yeah, it'd be great to have flowers, and we'd appreciate that gift. So I said, I'll bring it, I would, I would show it to you, we'll find a place, maybe at our info desk to, to keep it. And um, it's just a token of appreciation from her to you. So I just wanted to share that testimony. And just to share, if you'd like to join us or have friends that are coming up, we'll go in February, we'll announce the date for you. But you can also go out. So basically, we just take hot water and you know, um, little packets of coffee. We offer them to people and we pray with them, share the gospel, and invite them to church. That's all, that's all it is. But it's just been a great chance to connect with the community and get to know some people through that. Well, I'd like to invite um, our, our preacher for today, who's a, a friend and a, and a mentor to me. So Elder Bill Mumley, if you could come forward. We'll, we'll hear the word from him. Let's appreciate him for coming forward. He's an elder at Norway Chapel Gong Road. He's also become, a, him and his wife June, become a friend to BG and I. Um, so we've appreciated hearing from them. There are many stories, all the, the wisdom that Bill has, has gathered in his, his years in Kenya serving. So I'd just like to pray for him and then I'll invite him to share the word for us. And, 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 and as we begin the sermon, if there are any youth, you know, when I finish praying, Fred will join you for your session. So any teenagers who are here will have a session with you, at a discussion time. So anyone who's here who'd like to join that session, just head to the back and Fred will show you where you can go from there. But let's go ahead and pray together. Dear Lord, I do thank you for this time we have to worship together, to fellowship together in this place. And I thank you for, for Bill. I thank you for his life. I thank you for his ministry. And I thank you for his wisdom, the time he spent in your word, the time he spent learning from you. And I pray that you'd speak through him today. I pray that you would challenge all of us through the words that he brings to us, that we'd be able to hear from you through your word and through the message that he's prepared for us. But as we go into this new year, we go into this new year in your strength, in your power, and that we seek your glory in our lives, O oh Lord. I pray for us as a church that we continue to grow. I thank you for all the blessings you've given to us. And I pray that you continue to be with us in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you, Bill. Welcome. Well, it's still morning, isn't it? Good morning. Glad to be talking here. Good morning. It's a real privilege for me to be here. Everybody says that. But it really is a privilege to be here. Um, it's, it's exciting to see how much the church is growing. The last time I was here, uh, I sat on a hay bale uh, during the service. Uh, of course, it was a special occasion. But, uh, but now I'm looking at this place and I'm thinking, hey, this is all right. This is really nice. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, I, when we first came in, of course, when you first started the service, uh, there was probably 15 people here. And I thought, oh, okay, well, it's growing, it's doing okay. But now look, it's packed, and uh, it's very exciting. And so I'm going to be sharing with you, now that 2017 has approached, uh, and actually not approached, and we're in it, um, and many of us, as someone has already shared, have made some resolutions, and we're looking forward to a new year. But I know there's also challenges out there this year. And uh, when we finish the sermon, we want to give a, have a time, because the church is growing, but it's still a nice size that we can actually pray for one another. And so we'll be having a time of prayer to pray for people that want to bring some things before the Lord. But, uh, but I do want to share some things. Um, 
about uh, facing 2017 with confidence. And uh, back in 1989, about a year after my wife and I arrived in Kenya with our three kids, um, actually three and three quarters kids, um, a, few, a few months later Jared was born, and then later we had another one, so we had five kids here. Uh, but, and incidentally, greetings from Julie. Uh, she's at the Gong Hills Church. Uh, she has some responsibilities. She leads the Karibu tent at 9 o'clock. But she actually might come. She said she's going to get out of there as soon as possible and see if she can hear my sermon. And if you see her taking notes, it's because she has some things for me to correct when we get home. <laughs> but uh, but uh, back in 1989, when we first came, I worked with Life Ministry. I still am with a sponsoring organization, Campus Crusade for Christ. But while I was with Life Ministry in their campus ministry, I, I met a young student named Justice. Uh, at the Cheromo campus, and he uh, got into my Bible study, and it soon became clear that although he had a general awareness of what Christianity was about, he never really understood the clarity of the gospel. And then, as we talked one day, he decided to receive Jesus as his Savior and Lord with me, once he understood uh, the nature of the gospel. Now at the time I was old, well I still am older, I, but then, even then I was older, experienced and more knowledgeable than justice in spiritual matters. And, and so what I did was I began to disciple him, and I taught him, and I counseled him, and I trained him in a lot of life issues and ministry, but soon I began to delegate responsibilities to him even when he was a student. And when he graduated with a B.S. in microbiology from the University of Nairobi, he did not take the conventional path and go into his field of study, even though he was privileged to have that degree. But he responded to a call of God on his life, and he joined Life Ministry staff, even having to raise his own support as a graduate from the university. Um, I was the campus director at the time, and he joined my team, he was part of my team. Now, my relationship with him at that time was as an elder to a youth, uh, as a superior to a subordinate. And we were both comfortable with that arrangement. But then, over the years, something happened. This young man grew up. During our planning meetings as a staff team, his ideas began getting a better response than mine. I wasn't sure I liked that very much. On the campus, the students began to rally around his leadership. Some of you may know this guy. His name is Justice Kamal Mufia. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name, but I'm just going to call him Justice. It became increasingly clear that I needed to rethink his role on the team. And I actually went to the national director, uh, George Mondaleo, and I said, you know what, I think that we need to put justice on a track to become the campus director, and I need to step aside. Although I would always be older than justice, it was obvious that I needed to treat him less and less as a junior, and more and more as an emerging leader. However, there were some challenges to overcome in doing that. Some of those challenges were historical. We were accustomed to a certain pattern in our relationship. I was his superior, he was my subordinate, he was my disciple, I was his disciple. But we, as I began to move him into a leadership position, we started heading into some uncomfortable territory. And some of these hurdles that we had to overcome more significantly were in our attitudes. I needed to treat him more as a peer and a partner, but my pride resisted. And he needed to treat me more as a peer and a partner, but his feelings of insecurity and inadequacy resisted. Just as my pride was resisting, so his feelings of inadequacy were resisting. As we look back on those days, I learned something very significant and perhaps 
and perhaps a bit unusual about this concept of humility. It was clear from the start that humility was essential for me as a leader as I began to share and even give away some of my authority and influence to justice. That's not a surprise. But we both learned something else that actually surprised us and continues to be a bit of an interesting twist on this idea of humility. It wasn't long before we discovered that humility was also essential for justice. As he faced the new challenges in his life and his ministry, we learned that not only does humility remove a false sense of superiority, but humility, in a very interesting way, also removes a false sense of insecurity and weakness and inadequacy. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. As we head into this new year, with the fresh challenges that many of us are facing, some of them are terrifying, but also the opportunities that are there that can provide some really significant benefits to us, but we're hoping it works out. And even some personal discipline issues that were already mentioned, like exercise and Bible study and things like that. I think the Bible has something, in fact, I'm sure, the Bible has something important to say to us about confidence as we face 2017. From a variety of angles, from a variety of biblical angles. And here's what the Bible has to say. Humility is the curious key to confidence. So I've already been prayed for, but I would like to pray for you as we begin today. So let's pray together. Father, I do want to pray for everyone that's come here this morning. I believe that uh, in your sovereign loving kindness, you have brought them here. And I ask, Lord, that your word and your spirit and your presence would minister to everyone that's here, even me, because you're really good at that. And I pray that you would use me in all of my weaknesses uh, to speak, that you would speak to the men and women that are here, and that you would do so in such a way that only you can, into the deep recesses of our hearts and our minds, and addressing those issues that each one of us is going through right now. I know there's a lot of dramas out here, Lord, and I just ask that you would speak into those dramas in a way that gives confidence as we face 2017. So I thank you in advance for doing that, Lord. Trusting that you're faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. So humility is a curious key to confidence. With this in mind, I'd like us to read 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. I know we're at a new church and the technological glitches are probable, but uh, I hope it comes up on the screen. Is it going to be on the screen or should I just read it? Oh, somebody's running back to make it happen. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> but in the meantime, it's there. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, not just the younger guys, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now we all know that humility removes a false sense of superiority when it works right. However, humility, according to the Bible and biblical humility, does more than that. Humility removes a false sense of inadequacy to those of us who know Jesus. Humility removes a false sense of inadequacy. Let me elaborate. In verse 5 of this passage, 
I'm glad it's still up there. <clears throat> Peter says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. To the humble, grace is given. The verse is very clear that grace is denied to the proud. In fact, it's worse than that. Not only is there an absence of grace, there is the presence of something else that's a bit scary. To the proud, there is the presence of opposition. And not just any opposition, God's opposition. It might look like man's opposition, or circumstantial opposition, or maybe we just get stuck and we're not sure why. But when we lack humility, when we become proud, it is God Himself who opposes us according to this scripture. And if God is against us, who can be for us? When we experience pride, we will eventually find ourselves inadequate. That's why the proverb says that pride comes before the fall. That's a truism. And incidentally, I teach leadership theory. I have a PhD in organizational leadership. One of the things that they've discovered about leaders who fail is pride. And I don't have time to get into the dimensions of that, but it's a, it's a truth from Scripture that applies across the board. God, but God gives grace to the humble. Humility is simply realizing that blessing and favor come from God. Blessing and favor from God is something we desperately need. That's humility. Blessing and favor from God is something we desperately need. And apart from Him, we can do nothing. Again, these are all common scriptures that need to address this whole issue of humility in our lives. But pride is simply thinking that we, well, we'll call out to God when we're in trouble, but we don't need God's blessing and favor all the time, so we don't trust God for blessing and we don't ask God for favor. We might say the right prayer, Lord, please give me your favor and blessing in this or that endeavor. But when we lack humility, these words are from our lips, but not necessarily from our heart. The more we realize from the heart, however, that favor and blessing comes from God, something else happens. The more we become aware that that grace and that blessing are abundantly available to us from God, who is far above and beyond our own strength and our own ability. And with that brings amazing confidence when we can just get that through our heads. He gives grace to the humble. Pride, a false sense of personal quality and ability rooted in the self, is thinking incorrectly that our adequacy comes from ourselves. That's what pride is. Humility is simply thinking correctly that our adequacy comes from God. 2 Corinthians 3, 4, and 5 is the next verse I want to look at. And I want to focus on verse 5 first and then move up to, to verse 4. But look at 2 Corinthians 3, 5. It says that not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. This is humility. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything in ourselves, but our competence is from God. Once we become aware that our competence in a situation or a challenge or a goal that we have coming up in 2017 does not come from ourselves. Our competence does not come from ourselves as believers. Something very interesting happens. Let's move back up to verse 4. Look what uh, Paul says here. Such confidence as this is ours 
through Christ before God. Such confidence as this is ours. Confidence becomes ours. And this is not false confidence. Because God is really good at what He does. And He can give us the kind of power and direction and ability and capacity that we need to do the things that He's called us to do. For followers of Christ, there's a definite connection between humility and confidence. For those who have Jesus as their Savior, one of the benefits is that He saves us. He delivers us and establishes us in the face of the challenges and opportunities that always come our way. But even we believers can sometimes slip into, slip into thinking that our adequacy comes from our own strength and our own resources, especially when we see success and pride begins to creep in. This is a special warning, especially to you pastors, because pastors are particularly prone to this, and I do a lot of mentoring of pastors. But it's true for all of us, that when God blesses us materially, vocationally, ministerially, personally, there's a part of us that wants to say, I'm pretty cool. I, you know what? I'm, maybe I'm not such a bad guy after all. I'm strong. I'm powerful. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying that as long as we say it in Christ. But when we say it in ourselves, and we know that subtle difference that happens, then we have problems. Let me read a proverb to you that won't be up there, but it's one that I find very, very powerful. It's in Proverbs 27, 21, if you want to write it down. The crucible is for silver, and the furnace for gold. But a man is tested by the praise he receives. Praise tempts us to forget our inadequacy in ourselves. And I know that's counter to what the world is telling us. But in ourselves, because we live in a broken world, and we are broken people being repaired by Jesus. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. And we need to remember that in ourselves, we are inadequate. But when we are leaning on Jesus, we are more than adequate. We are more than conquerors. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. On the other hand, a false sense of insecurity is thinking that we're inadequate because of our own lack of personal strength and ability. Oh, I could never do that. I, I'm, I'm much too weak for that. That's not something that, that uh, I could ever try. That's faulty thinking. In such instances, what we're doing is we're putting our hope in ourselves. It's about me. We're saying the sense of inadequacy grows out of the same root as pride itself. Humility is not saying that God cannot use me. Humility is not saying that God cannot change me or that God cannot enable me. That's not humility. That's timidity. God has not given us a spirit of timidity. 1 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but, on the other hand, He has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of discipline. Interesting. Think of your goals for 2017. Power. Boy, I need some power to get this stuff done. Love. Boy, I need some love to get, deal with that issue. And discipline. How can I manage to accomplish these goals that I've set for myself? He's given us a spirit of power and love and discipline. And if we're looking inside ourselves to find those things, it won't happen. Willpower 
won't power you. Willpower won't power. Willpower won't power you. But His power will power And so, it, willpower is important as long as it's connected with Jesus. Christian humility realizes that God has given to us a spirit of power and love and disciplines, but that these powerful assets come from Him. Every day, we need to say, Jesus, today I need your power, your love, and your discipline. It's not just in times of emergency. It's every moment of every day. And through His Spirit, He can actually give us that spirit of power and love and discipline. It's a continual attitude of dependence on Him, which gives us a confidence in Him, which gives us confidence. As we think about our goals for 2017, just think about what we can do with God's power and love and discipline as we pursue those goals. As I said, willpower won't power us, but His power will power us. And both the false sense of superiority and the false sense of inadequacy, there is a mistaken belief that our adequacy comes from ourselves. The Christian who feels superior because of himself or herself, and the one who feels inadequate in himself or herself, are both mistaken. If we feel inadequate to do the things that God is directing us to do, we're mistaken and we're looking at the wrong place. We're looking at our own capacity, not just the capacity of God to empower us. It's mistaken because of a lack of humility, biblical humility, not timidity. Let's go back to 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Look at this question from another angle. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Humility results in being lifted up. Humility results in enabling. Humility results in confidence because power rising up and competence come from God's mighty hand. On us, with us, through us, however you want to prepositionalize it. Note that Peter makes the same connection between humility and confidence, but from a different angle. Verses 6 and 7 are one sentence. In fact, let me read it again. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, comma, not period, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Peter is saying that there is a direct connection between humbling ourselves and release from anxiety. And there's a reason, this is reasonable, when we consider a couple of things. Humility is thinking correctly that our adequacy comes from God. Anxiety is simply a response to our sense of our own inadequacies that makes us feel vulnerable and threatened. It is this realization of our own weaknesses that we are to cast on the Lord. Casting our anxieties on the Lord. It is this real, uh, in the middle of verse, of, of verse 7, Peter says, because. Casting all of your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Because is a very important word. It's because He cares for you. And He does. The question is, do we believe that? The original wording may actually be more important because actually in the original language, the way it phrased it is, what, because what concerns you matters to him. That's how it literally reads out. What concerns you matters to him. <clears throat> when we cast our challenges 
and our goals and our anxieties on God. And I know there is out there. He takes responsibility for us and, and, the, and His goals for us and His challenges for us and our anxieties because He wants to, because He cares for us. He acts on our behalf with a mighty hand, a caring heart, and perfect wisdom. He is too loving to be unconcerned about what's happening in your life right now. He is too wise to make a mistake surrounding you. And he is too strong to fail. As we face 2017, we must come to him and cast our anxieties on him. Casting our anxiety on him means saying, Lord, you lift me up. You care for me. You are almighty God. I will trust you. I will walk with you. I will obey you. But I need you to be my Savior. This is what it means to trust Jesus as Savior. It's not just about getting to heaven. He is a Savior above and beyond that. Now, of course, it's primarily about that, you could argue. But it's not only about that. But He's our Savior in our day-to-day -day victories and setbacks. His adequacy, adequacy replaces our inadequacy. His care replaces our fear. Confidence in Him gives us a confidence that's grounded in humility. I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a wonderful story that illustrates this principle that's found in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. And in that passage, we have see a story of involving Moses before the Lord. And so the passage says, So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. That's my challenge for you, Moses. That's my direction for you, Moses. That's what I'm asking you to do. Moses says, but Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. Moses continues to argue and eventually God gets annoyed and says, Aaron can go with you. But at this point, he says, I will be with you. Moses, when challenged by God, asked, who am I? Who am I is the wrong question. Moses was displaying timidity, not humility, not biblical humility. It was a false humility that had the same root as pride. To Moses, it was about his abilities and his resources and about Moses. Pride asks, who am I? and becomes arrogant. Inadequacy asks, who am I? and becomes anxious. Humility does not ask the question, who am I? Humility asks the question, who is God? And that makes all the difference. God's response to Moses is very simple. Moses, I will be with you. Moses finally got the message. And when Moses learned to ask the question, who is God, as he faced the challenges of his life and his work and his people, he became one of the most successful men in history.
So Moses became one of the greatest men of history. And again, not of biblical history only, but of all of history. A secret to Moses' great success is found in Numbers 12.3. Very interesting verse. Numbers 12.3, it says, Now Moses was a very humble man. More humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. But it was biblical humility. And he became great. He became confident. He became adequate, not in himself, but in the God who called him. Humility actually removes a false sense of insecurity. The question, who am I, is the wrong question. As we face 2017, the right question is, who is God? Humility is a curious key to confidence. For those of us who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we can face 2017 with the confidence that we have a Savior that rescues us from more than just hell. Our competence comes from our Savior, our living Savior, who is resurrected and walking with us today. We can cast all our anxiety on, on our Savior. Who am I is the wrong question. Who is God is the right question. Humility is the curious key to confidence. And so my prayer for all of us who have received Jesus as Savior is that we see the fullness of what this salvation means. It is not simply about going to heaven when we die. Of course it includes that and of course that's important. But it's not simply about that, nor is it simply about getting some important prayers answered here and there. It's about our ongoing adequacy as we walk with Him and allow Him to direct us and empower us with the Holy Spirit. But there's also probably some people here today who have not yet made the decision to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here because your New Year's resolution is to start going to church. You're a good church-going person who wants to do the right thing, but you're still on a spiritual journey without having received Christ as Savior. Now, let me say something a little bold. If you're here today and you have not received Jesus as Savior, I want to say something for you with great concern and great compassion. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, he respects your decision. He honors your decision. And He's not your Savior. You can come to church. You can be a good moral person. But much of that is rooted in a, in a desire to become adequate in ourselves. If I just go to church, if I just try to do the right things, then maybe I'll be okay before God and say, you know, I, I tried my level best, Lord. The hope-filled message of this sermon depends on having a living, saving relationship with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.5 says, Not that we are adequate in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. The truth, this truth also applies to a person's acceptability before God. We are not adequate in ourselves, and we will never be, no matter how hard we try. Until Jesus becomes our Savior, we are declared guilty before God and suffer a self-imposed, self-imposed banishment from His kingdom and His blessings. He may graciously answer a prayer here and there and provide some way out here and there, but if He's not our Savior, if we haven't asked Him to be our, our Savior, He's not our Savior. Making offerings to God through church attendance is good, but it's inadequate. Trying to be a good person is good, but it's inadequate. The penalty due to God, due to God by every man because of our sins against Him, and we can all admit that we've done that, 
is infinite death. Without Christ as our substitute Savior, the only way to pay this infinite death, and we can do it, is by going to hell forever. It's the only way we can pay it. Unless we have an alternative, which is Jesus. Even here, in our acceptability before God, our adequacy can only come from Him. But you know what? That's the good news. Our salvation, our adequacy, our forgiveness, our okayness before God is something that He has done. It's not something that we must do. Righteousness is something we do because we're born again and we want to act that way if we're truly born again. But His provision through His Son's infinite death as an offering for our life is God's adequate provision for our complete acceptance before God and our access to His grace, His wisdom, His power for a life of confidence and hope because of what He did and because of what He does. It's about Him. And He does it really well. I've talked to person after person that says, I don't want to trust Christ because I might backslide. They're misunderstanding the gospel. When Jesus saves you, He not only saves you, He gives you the power to be transformed. And He will do it if we ask Him to. He will do it. He will do it. And we respond. He enables us. We have a role to play, sure. But the energy, the strength, the adequacy comes from Him. It's not about what you or I have done or about what you and I will do. It's about what He has done and what He will continue to do as our Savior through our whole lives. He is the Savior. We don't save ourselves because we cannot save ourselves. We don't even live, live the victorious Christian life because we cannot do that. But He can. And He does. Through us. This is the hope of the gospel. Jesus can do it. He can do it even through you. He can even do it through me. That's the hope of the gospel. We can earn, he can give us eternal life. And He can give us life, life. As we walk through it. If you're here today and you have not received Jesus as your Savior and Lord. We're going to close here in a minute, but I do want to ask you, come forward and talk to me or talk to one of the pastors. Because we want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior, so that He can be your Savior. For the rest of us who have already trusted Him as Savior, we need to remember that He's not just our Savior giving us a ticket to heaven, He's our Savior that delivers us and enables us to love our wives, as was talked about earlier, our husbands, to love our kids. He enables us to meet those goals. He enables us to face that challenge, to overcome that problem. He is a deliverer. He is a Savior, and He's alive. He rose from the dead. He's on His throne in the heavens. He sent His Spirit to indwell us and to enable us. He, 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 not it, not Christianity, He, Jesus, is our Savior. And so my challenge for all of us today is to come in a fresh way to Jesus, those of us who know Him, I'm talking now, and say, Jesus, I need You. Not just Bible study, not just prayer, not just church work. I need You, Jesus. Invigorate me. Renew me. Refresh me. Continually through this year. Enable me to face these challenges. And for those of you who don't know Jesus, haven't trusted Him as a Savior, you respect Him, you like going to church, you want to be a good person, it's an animal. You need a Savior. You need Him to come into your, you need to receive Him as your Savior and trust Him to rescue you from the fundamental problem, which is a broken relationship with God. So whatever category you might want some prayer for, I encourage you after the service to come forward, meet one of the pastors, I'll be up here as well, and we'd like to pray with you. But I know we're out of time, and Karen is a time-sensitive community, and so I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. 
Jesus, I thank you that you said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus, we need you to be with us, even today. Uh, we need you to be with us as our Savior, as our Lord. And uh, we know that when we trust you, you will never disappoint. When we trust ourselves, we are inadequate. But we want to trust you, Jesus, in a fresh way. And as we face 2017, I pray that this will be a breakthrough year for us. Because of you. We're not as strong as you, but you are as strong as you. And we ask you to use us, enable us. Lord, enable us to be, to do all things through you who strengthens us. And I pray especially for those who don't know you as your Savior and Lord. Lord, I pray that you would whisper in their hearts and have them make the decision to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior, even today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>Thank you so much for that, Bill. We really appreciate hearing from you and the chance to reflect on our year. And I pray that we could go forward in God's confidence and in proper humility. I'll ask you to rise to your feet as we come to the end of our service. If you are a first-time visitor, please make your way to the back, and we'd love to meet you over a cup of tea to get to know you. Please bring the cards that you uh, filled out, and we'll take those from you. I think Victor will be there. I, I believe the Kilus be around. Yeah, so we'll get a chance to meet you at our visitor's corner. If you'd like to do plug-in, as you mentioned, we'll also set aside some chairs for that, and Fred will be meeting you to discuss the details of plug-in. So let's go ahead and, and share the words of the grace together as we dismiss for our tea. And now, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.